let's start with the prehistory. Um, there were cases brought in this struggle for civil rights that, um, um, that were sustained and nourished by the NAACP. There were cases challenging discrimination in graduate schools and professional schools. Right. Um, there was uh, a case called Sweat v. Painter, which, uh, in which the Supreme Court held that um, a, a law school was not equal, uh, a black law school was not equal to a white law school. They, they, didn't they try to give that guy like his own room? Or right, or sit him in the back of the, yeah. of, of the class. And and um, and then there was another case, um, and there was another case called McLaurin. Yeah. And um, and again, uh, both of these cases were cases which were leading to um, were leading toward a challenge to the doctrine of separate but equal in some ways, but in in most respects, uh, uh, they were really testing the equality part. They were testing the equality part of this notion. They were they were saying that the facilities that the black um, that the black student had was not uh, those facilities were not equal. Let me interject something. Here. Yeah, Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP knew, did they not, that if they just marched forward head on into battle, saying overturn Plessy versus Ferguson, is it? Uh, and declare that separate is never equal, equal, they were dead bang losers. So what they did is they, they created a strategy that will chip away. Well, so mm -hmm. It's not equal here, it's not equal there, mm -hmm. it's not equal in mm -hmm. third place. After f eight or nine of those cases, you begin to get, you can get people thinking, well, geez, it's never equal anywhere. Mm -hmm. But go mm -hmm. ahead. The court was never presented in those cases with the proposition that separate was Un inherently unequal. Or at least no case dependent on that proposition. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. I mean, um, uh, it, it was, it, it, the Henderson case, which I told you about earlier, was really, as far as I understand, um, the first case in which, in which, certainly it was the first case in which the federal government, uh, U.S. government argued it, um, that, uh, that essentially separate but equal was unconstitutional, the treatment of separate, uh, the use of uh, separate but equal facility. Yeah. Yeah. Around this time, we're, we're talking about around 1950, um, the, the NAACP began to bring cases uh, involving public elementary schools. And you asked me about Philip Perlman. The, um, in, the early, in those cases involving the graduate schools, after, um, after Shelley versus Kramer, um, Philip Perlman uh, uh, found out that he actually um, received a great deal of praise for having argued that case, and he signed on. He supported filing amicus briefs in those other cases involving graduate schools. In 1950, around 1950, when the NAACP started to bring cases involving public elementary schools, Perlman considered it an entirely different matter, according to Phil. According to Phil, Perlman was completely unmovable on whether, on the issue of whether the government should in, should intervene on behalf of file on behalf of the NAACP causes in those cases. And um, during that period. Phil, who continued to have a uh, regular conversation with Frankfurter, told me that he would speak to Frankfurter about those cases as they were developing. He said because he never believed that um, the U.S. government was going to be involved in those cases uh, because Perlman was intransigent. According to Phil, Phil learns during that period of time what the different justices think about um, from Frankfurter yeah. about the uh, 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 the question of school integration at the elementary school level, and Phil uh, said to me that 
um, during the course of those conversations, he developed a pretty sophisticated understanding of where the different justices were. Not knowing, of course, he said, that um, Perlman wouldn't be there very long. Because what happened was that Perlman left. And I won't go into the circumstances under which Perlman left, but, um, but Perlman was replaced. And so after Perlman is replaced, um, he's replaced, uh, there's a whole series of events involving corruption in the Truman administration and one person and another um, uh, leaving office. And, and so it comes to somebody named Stern who ends up as an, as a, uh, an interim. Right. And, um, and suddenly we have a new situation and Phil is authorized to go ahead and work on a brief in Brown. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.